session and I've just started the recording. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to uh, talk to Cal today a word about um, pollinators. But first, I want to start and give you a little background about the Dan River Basin Association. Uh, we serve 3,300 square miles. Our service area covers North Carolina and Virginia, about 16 counties combined, and it is everywhere that the Dan River flows and all of its tributaries. We have three major priorities, recreation, education, and stewardship. We believe that when people get out and enjoy nature, they want to learn more about it, and then once they learn more about it, they want to protect it for future generations. We all, our focus on recreation includes first Saturday outings. We have an awesome paddle coming up in the uh, first Saturday of July at Beaver Creek. Uh, we construct parks, trails, and river access throughout the 3,300 square miles. We work with municipalities and citizen groups for master planning, and we have an interactive map on our site that shows trails and river access throughout our entire region, and we do special outings throughout the year as well. In addition, our education programs are amazing, award-winning, actually, and um, trout in the classroom, our streamside trees in the classroom. We reach about 10,000 students a year with our programming in the schools. We do green school programming to help campuses become more green, public workshops, and if you haven't checked out our DARBA at home, new resources started uh, recently. Definitely check that out. There's some fun things to do with your um, kids, grandkids, spouse, family, neighbor, whomever. And finally, our stewardship. Um, we do water quality testing. Uh, we have a great protector certification program that's free. We look at riparian buffers throughout the area to make sure our waterways stay safe. And storm drain marking and cleanups throughout the region. So with that said, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to introduce Cal Ivanov. He's an entomologist <laughs> um, who specializes in, and Cal, forgive me if I completely destroy this, hymnoptera? Hymnoptera. Hymnoptera. Um, and that is includes ants, bees, and wasps, but he primarily focuses on ants. He joined the Virginia Museum of Natural History in 2014, and he is currently the associate curator in the Department of Recent Inver Invertebrates. He's received a master degree in entomology from Sofia University in Bulgaria and a PhD in ecology from the Cleveland State University. He has worked as a research biologist at the Institute of Zoology at the Bulgaria, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, collections assistants, um, chair and secretary for the entomology section of the Virginia Academy of Sciences. I'm, he's got a long list of titles and uh, accreditation. So um, right now he has joined the Virginia Natural History Society in 2015. He's a counselor in 2017 and he's vice president in 2018. He has authored numerous peer reviewed and popular articles on ant and wasps taxonomy, ecology, natural history, community ecology, and invasion biology. <sighs> Would you like to add anything to that, Cal? Uh, not, not at present. All right. I think you captured it well. All right. So I am going to hand over my screen to Cal, and he's going to start his presentation. There is a chat box. Um, if you hover at the bottom or the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A or a chat box. I'll be monitoring those as Cal is doing his presentation. So feel free to add any information you want um, and I will make sure that we answer those questions and we will leave some time at the end so that you can ask questions at the end. So Cal, go ahead, get started. Thanks Tiffany for, uh, for the nice uh, introduction. I'll share my screen with you and hopefully you all can uh, hear me well. So, uh, as Tiffany mentioned, I'm a myrmecologist by trade, so I'm a little bit outside of my comfort zone today. The presentation that you'll see is, uh, has been developed over the past few months, mostly as an outreach activity 
for uh, Waynesboro and the surrounding areas, and some of you probably already know that the uh, Virginia Museum of Natural History is uh, planning an expansion of opening a satellite campus in Waynesboro uh, in, the, in the near future. But uh, today, I'm going to talk about pollinators, uh, a very general overview, a rather brief overview, because we can spend uh, probably an entire month talking about pollinators without even getting into the uh, intricacies of pollinator identification. Uh, and uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, hopefully we'll have time to answer a few questions that you might have. And uh, for those of you that uh, know me, I typically like to pace around while I talk and for a first time I actually confined to a chair. So let's see how this goes. And uh, I'll start with a, with a familiar image. Uh, our unique planet that uh, possesses features that are found no place else in the solar system, including oxygenated atmosphere, of course, liquid water, active geology and plate tectonics, but probably the most unique feature of this planet, of course, is uh, the presence of life, something that uh, has not been encountered nowhere else in the known universe. And uh, biodiversity is just a, a broad term that encompasses all life as we know it. That those that are uh, those living forms that are still existing today, and of course, the numerous forms that have extent in the geological past of our planet. How many critters, plants and animals, and uh, single-celled organisms inhabit our planet is probably one of the most fundamental questions in, in science, but uh, the answer to this uh, question uh, has eluded scientists for a very, very long time. Uh, that hasn't stopped many from uh, providing some, some estimates of how many species actually are expected to be, to be found on our planet. Uh, Mora and colleagues uh, in, back in 2011 uh, estimated that there are expected uh, about 8.7, give or take a million species of eukaryotic organisms only expected to be found on our planet. That is in vast contrast with the roughly 2 million described species that we have at present. So there is still a lot of work to be done. And this only concerns Again, eukaryotic organisms, your familiar plants and animals, protists and the like. But uh, another study more recently attempted the unimaginable, if you wish, to estimate how many prokaryotic organisms. Researchers from Indiana University using scaling laws estimated that there are north of 100 billion species of prokaryotic organisms and even as high as one trillion species very, very hard to wrap our mind, uh, mind around it. But probably some of the most notable, some of the most familiar of these organisms are of course plants and plant life as we know it. Uh, from the maritime forest and the sand dune plant communities of Virginia's Eastern shore on top to the pine oak woodlands of the Piedmont, the subalpine zones of the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains, all these unique habitats are described to a large extent by their plant members. And when we talk about plants, we can use uh, three uh, different uh, concepts, three different definitions, starting from the most inclusive on top to the least inclusive on the bottom. We can talk about uh, plants in a very broad sense. Those includes the familiar green plants and their close uh, algal relatives. Those are your red algae and a small group of freshwater algae known as glucophytes. In a more strict sense, we can talk strictly about uh, a group known as viridi planty or green plants. Those includes your land plants and their closest relatives from which they have uh, evolved. And those are your green algae, the chlorophytes and carophytes, algae that are most closely related to our familiar land plants. And of course, the most uh, that the least inclusive, the, the plants in the strictest sense includes embryophytes or land plants. Plants, uh, land plants evolved uh, sometimes in the Paleozoic and they transition to land. Our best estimates are roughly about 470 million years ago. And uh, during the Devonian, they uh, spread on land 
And in the Carboniferous periods, they formed the first large forested areas on land. And many of those, of course, now remain as fast coal deposits. And uh, ultimately, land plants diversified. And currently, there are roughly about 374,000 species of plants, the vast majority of which are flowering plants or angiosperms. Angiosperms diverge from their close relatives, the gymnosperms, including the familiar conifers, sometimes during the Triassic, and then vastly diversified during the Cre uh, Cretaceous period, that is roughly about 104, 40 million years ago. And uh, due to the presence of uh, flowers, the presence of fruits, they created uh, a rather strict uh, uh, species specific system. The flowers uh, allow these species to prevent cross pollination and ultimately create a vast array of known species. We're talking roughly about 290, 295,000 of those plant species are angiosperms. So they evolved in the Cretaceous and ultimately came to dominate most, if not all, terrestrial communities. Pollination, of course, is a critical step in the reproduction of all plants, not just uh, flowering plants. And it comes, pollination comes in uh, two flavors, depending on what mode is used to transfer the pollen to the female portion of the plant. And we can talk about abiotic pollination. Pollination does, does not require living organisms. And of course, biotic pollination that requires an biotic agent, agent or an organism to transfer the pollen to the female parts. And the vast majority of the plants use other organisms, use uh, animals for that task. Uh, if you think uh, most trees, uh, most grasses, uh, virtually all conifers rely on wind. And uh, if you recall early in spring in uh, this part of the world, uh, your car readily gets covered or your porch or uh, your deck uh, with uh, the yellow dust. And that yellow dust is nothing but copious amounts of pollens that are released earlier in the season. And because uh, abiotic pollination does not require critters, does not require to attract those critters, the flowers of such plants are typically rather small. They're very drab looking and they produce a large amount of small pollen grains that can be easily carried either by wind or water. But of course, the vast majority of the plants, over 80% require help of animals. And uh, pollination, biotic pollination in particular is an example, uh, one of the greatest examples of coevolution of where two different groups have come together and they mutually benefit each other. On the right here, you can see one of the most current phylogenies or our most current understanding how insect groups have diversified. And there have been a couple periods of vast diversification and expansion. Uh, the first one occurred uh, in the Carboniferous period roughly about 350 million years ago when uh, insects took flight. Uh, thereafter, in late in the Carboniferous in the subsequent periods, they diversified again uh, when they adapted to feeding on gymnosperms. And ultimately the last and the highest radiation that gave pretty much the current makeup of the insect world occurred in the Cretaceous period and coincided with diversification of flowering plants. And uh, before we move forward, uh, just a very quick word uh, about pollen. Pollen, depending on the mode of pollination, uh, uh, a look, a close look at pollen and pollen grace can uh, pretty much tell us something about the plants and its mode of pollination. Those that are pollinated by wind or water typically have smaller pollen grains as the two that you see up top. The one on the left is uh, from corn. The one to the right is a uh, grass pollen grain. And you can see they're small, they're round, and typically very, very light, so they can be easily carried. Uh, away. And uh, two on the bottom, the two images represent on the left, you have a daisy pollen uh, on the right uh, dandelion. You can see that those are 
uh, typically barbed or have structures on their surface that allow them to attach to their pollinators and ultimately be effectively carried by them. And they're typically a little bit larger and also they're heavier. So if we actually look and uh, down in the, the fossil records, pollen grains uh, do preserve rather well. So looking, we can actually reconstruct, reconstruct the makeup of those communities and see if they were dominated by one or another group. And uh, pollination uh, now we believe evolved sometimes in the late Paleozoic or the early Mesozoic. And it was a chance event at first. It was uh, most likely adopted by beetles, the most diverse group of multicellular organisms that we have on our planet. So they were uh, attracted to those early plants to feed on pollen, but inadvertently they carried that pollen to another plant, thus helping in pollination. And uh, with that, uh, certain floral traits uh, that actually promoted that uh, chance event that increased the chances of being carried away to other plants of the same species ultimately were encouraged. And that's how we believe that intricate coevolution between the two groups first uh, started. And uh, currently there are an estimated about uh, 200,000 species of animals that act as uh, pollinators. Of those, only about a thousand are vertebrates, and we're talking uh, some of the more familiar ones are, of course, birds, uh, bats uh, in some tropical areas, um, primates who also help pollination, and some more unusual vertebrates include lizards and even uh, snakes, but the vast majority of the world's flowering plants are pollinated by insects, uh, especially things such as uh, bees and, of course, uh, uh, wasps, butterflies, uh, moths, and the like. But what makes a, a good pollinator? Of course, not every insect is a pollinator. And for example, the group that I study, uh, in particular ants, ants are not good pollinators. They're, even if they pollinate some plants, they're typically one of many pollinators that are attracted to these, uh, these plants. And there is very, very few exceptions. So the first uh, so-called requirement, if you wish, uh, or a feature is that uh, pollinators, or at least effective pollinators, have to be mobile. They have to be able to move from one flower or one set of flowers to another rather quickly. And it's not surprising that the world's best pollinators are those that can fly. Uh, they also have to have structures on their body to promote the transfer of pollen, structures that will allow the pollen to adhere to their body, such as the image that you see here, uh, a honeybee covered with pollen grains. Uh, so hairs on the body or feathers, in the case of birds, of course, are good structures to allow for pollen attachment. And of course, they have to be attracted to these flowers. They have to receive something in return. And it's not surprising that that coevolution is underlined for benefits, by benefits for both groups. Plants get uh, pollinated and of course they're pollinated to receive uh, a reward, and that reward is typically comes in the form of uh, food. We're talking either pollen, of course, or nectar. And of course, in order for them to take advantage of those resources, they have to have some uh, specialized feeding structures. Think of the long uh, bill of a hummingbird or a sunbird, or the long proboscis of moths and butterflies. All of these are adaptations for more efficient feeding on uh, these, uh, these rewards. And uh, lastly, of course, and probably most importantly, it makes little sense if those pollinators come to one flower and then uh, leave it and fly to another flowers of a different species. So they have to be attracted to a group of species or in some unusual circumstances, even to a single species in order to promote, promote that uh, cross-pollination fertilization and uh, it's not surprising that uh, in order to promote that plants have evolved certain uh, set of traits and we refer to those as pollination syndromes so these involve uh, color shape and size and the color the time that those flowers are opened in order to attract a specific group of pollinators and promote them carrying pollen to other members of the same species. 
Uh, pollination syndromes uh, have uh, been worked for a very long time, but uh, something to remember that these are rather generalizations. They're not uh, hard and fast rules, uh, and many, many exceptions do exist, as we'll see in the subsequent uh, slides. For example, birds are visually oriented, and birds are therefore attracted to large flowers, those that are typically red or orange in color. And uh, they also have uh, a lot of nectar to provide to their bird pollinators. And now very quickly, we will look at the major pollination syndrome groups. And we'll start with vertebrates and then we'll shift to invertebrates. So I already mentioned that birds are important pollinators, especially in warmer climate. Humming, hummingbirds in the new world, some birds in the old world, honey eaters, honey creepers, are birds that are almost entirely specialized on feeding in, uh, on nectar. Again, long beaks, visually attracted to brightly colored flowers, large flowers, copious amounts of nectar to, of course, supply their high energy demands. And uh, these flowers are typically unscented. So they are not attracted to the scent of the flowers, but they are, are they're visually attracted. Uh, so other uh, birds, such as uh, a lot of passerines, uh, loris, lorikeets, uh, are typically larger birds that have a more generalized diet. And they get attracted to larger flowers, typically flowers that have some perching spot nearby on which they can rest, as opposed to hummingbirds and sunbirds. And they simply uh, uh, supplement their diet with uh, the nectar that they derived from those flowers. Another important group of uh, vertebrate pollinators include bats. And of course, bats are active at night and uh, they are attracted to flowers that are typically pale, very, very large and uh, very heavily scented. And some very familiar uh, fruits such as mangoes, uh, guavas, bananas, for example, are all uh, pollinated by bats. The pictures of the lesser uh, long-nosed bat that you see on this slide, uh, a species that is found in the American Southwest, is uh, one such species that is primarily responsible for pollination of agaves and many different species of uh, cacti. And uh, now we switch to uh, insect pollinators. Uh, the first group are beetles, and uh, beetle pollination is known as cantarophily. Beetles are typically attracted to larger flowers or clusters of flowers, flowers that are open, that provide a perching spot. And beetles, because of their chewing moth parts, are primarily uh, uh, after the pollen that is produced in these flowers. Uh, and uh, therefore, the, the flowers that attract beetles are typically not, uh, uh, they do not produce uh, much, much nectar. However, they're heavily scented in order to attract their beetle pollinators. And then uh, flies. Flies are important pollinators, especially in a uh, high latitude and uh, high altitude systems in which many of the other more common pollinators such as uh, bees and butterflies may be uh, reduced in numbers or may be completely absent. Uh, some uh, uh, bee groups, uh, some fly groups, excuse me, such as the, the bee fly, family Bombylidae on the left, and hoverflies or surfeit flies, family surfeity on the right. Uh, contain individuals, uh, the adult of which are actually feeding on nectar and therefore they are attracted to flowers that are um, typically visually attractive. They are purplish or pink uh, in, in color. They may have landing platforms or in the case of bee flies, they actually may have longer tubes that allow for the long proboscis of those flies to access the nectar at the bottom of those tubes. And uh, typically these are not heavily scented. So this form of fly pollination is known as myophily. And the second flavor is known as sapromyophily. Sapromyophily, of course, named after the fact that uh, this group of pollinators are typically critters, such as flesh flies and blowflies, that oviposit on dead and decaying matter. Think of uh, animal bodies or, or animal dung. 
So the plants are very, uh, produce flowers that are very drab in appearance. They're kind of brownish or reddish in color. And uh, they emit very, very strong odors, typically putrid or odors, so odors that uh, humans will not find very pleasant. And one great example, of course, is the carrion, fly, carrion plant of Southern Africa uh, <clears throat> that uh, emits such strong odors and typically attracts pollinators, but offers virtually no reward for them. So it's kind of in a sense that plant is deceiving its pollinators. And because no rewards are uh, provided, uh, those pollinators typically uh, visit those flowers for only a very short period of time after which fly, but they are loaded with pollen grains and therefore promote uh, pollination. But saprophyllia is actually far, far less uh, uh, common as compared to myophily. And uh, the next group, uh, psychophily, is uh, pollination by butterflies probably one of the most familiar and one of the most important pollinators. These are typically large flowers because uh, butterflies are visually oriented, a variety of different colors, and they're anything from uh, orange, think of butterfly weed, or of course the pinkish, whitish flowers, or milkweed, such as the picture up top. Uh, some may be white or yellow. Uh, typically, the nectaries are located at, at the bottom of a fairly long spur that can be actually reached only by the long proboscis of butterflies. And of course, a related group, moths uh, pollinate flowers that are very, very similar in appearance and scent to those pollinated by bats, simply because uh, most uh, moths, as opposed to butterflies, are of course, uh, nocturnal or active at night and uh, probably the most uh, important group of uh, moth pollinators are sphingid moths or hawk moths. And here you see examples of the Carolina, uh, also known as the tobacco sphinx moth, uh, which is very, very closely related, of course, to the tomato hornworm or the tomato hawk moth that uh, I'm sure those of you that have gardens have uh, seen on your tomato plants. And uh, these flowers are typically, of course, open at, uh, at dusk or at night when their pollinators are active. And of course, probably the most familiar group of pollinators and probably if we have to rank them, one of the most important group of pollinators are those that are pollinated by the vast array of different bee species. These flowers um, are as diverse in their appearance as are the pollinators that they attract. Uh, but uh, one more common feature across these, uh, these plants is that uh, their flowers look different in the UV spectrum. At the bottom right, you see a picture of a dandelion. The one on the right is uh, using visible light. The one picture or, or part of the picture on, on the left is actually a picture taken under UV light. And you can see that the pollen and the nectar area is actually marked differently in a different color in the UV spectrum and serves as a guide or a nectar guide for those species. And uh, bees, as we said, are important. They're highly diverse. But how do we tell them apart from uh, their close relatives, the wasps? In many cases, uh, uh, many people mislabel wasps as bees and uh, bees as wasps uh, simply because they're very, very similar. As a matter of fact, bees are nothing more than just glorified wasps. But, uh, and they differ in a number of features. Many of those, of course, you'll have to uh, place your specimen under high magnification in order to see details in the structure of the legs, the venation on the wings. But uh, one, uh, one common feature shared by most bees is the fact that they're, they're fuzzy. And they're fuzzy because their body is covered in hairs. Not only covered in hairs, but uh, those hairs, as opposed to wasp hairs, are branched. They're plumose, feathery, if you wish. And of course, that is in response for them to serve as attachment spots for the pollen grains, making, of course, bees very, very effective pollinators. And uh, there are roughly about 20,000 species of bees worldwide. Distributed over seven families, 
six of which are widespread and six, those six families are found in North America, including Eastern United States. Uh, the seventh family, Stenotritidae, is a rather small group of large, uh, uh, fast-moving bees that is restricted to Australia. And some of those uh, you probably recognize, things such as carpenter bees and uh, bumblebees. Of course, your honeybee, but there is a vast array of uh, other bee species. And the majority of the bee species, as opposed to bumblebees, and honeybees are not social, they're solitary, meaning that they do not live in large family groups. And uh, some examples include squash bees and longhorn bees, uh, your mason, mason bees, polyester bees, sweat bees, and that wide diversity of forms, of course, uh, is also matched by the wide diversity of feeding habits, different behaviors, different nesting sites. Some prefer to nest in the ground, some prefer to nest in tree cavities, branch cavities made by other animals. Uh, some of them uh, nest in hollow stems and uh, so on and so forth. And what I'm sharing here with you, this pie chart is a recent study that was conducted in uh, Pennsylvania that tells you that uh, there are currently uh, 450 species of bees that have been found to live in Pennsylvania. And you can see that a large fraction of that chart is taken by the four largest family, including Halictidae, those are your tiny, shiny sweat bees, the APD, including your honeybees and bumblebees, and uh, Megachilidae, your leaf cutters and mason bees, and uh, Andran Andranidae, the ground nesting uh, bees. But uh, Now we, we're going to switch uh, gears a little bit. And uh, now that we have uh, introduced the, the major players, we'll take a closer look at actually the groups that are showing some or no specialization to their plant partners. For example, some uh, plant groups such as the parsley or the carrot family that is pictured on the top image uh, produces clusters of flowers that attract a vast array of uh, pollinators, anything from beetles and wasps to flies and uh, bees. Uh, another similar example is um, the aster family or the sunflower family, which uh, shows a very similar lack of specialization, if you wish. wish. Other groups show a specialization of uh, pollinators to a specific group of species of closely related species. The New World uh, Euglosines or orchid bees are one such group that specializes on pollinating orchids or specific groups of orchids. The false birds of paradise of the New World so, so show a specialization towards being pollinated by hummingbirds. And in the extreme end of the spectrum, we have the extreme specialist uh, and a great example are the fig wasps in the family Agaoni, which almost, almost exclusively pollinate a single species of fig trees. And now we'll just go through a few of those examples and look at some unusual forms of uh, pollination. So what you see here is a drawing of a species of orchid known as the comet orchid that is found in uh, Madagascar back in uh, 1862 when uh, Darwin was conducting work on uh, fertilization of orchids, he was provided with a sample of a few specimens of that species that was sent to him uh, uh, from Madagascar. And the unusual, he noted the unusual feature that uh, that particular orchid has this very, very, very long spur that can reach over a foot long. As a matter of fact, the Latin name Sesquipedale means a foot and a half, referring to the extremely long length of that spur and the nectaries are located at the base of the spur. So there he surmised that there should be a very, very specialized pollinator that uh, has to have a feeding structure long enough to reach those nectaries. And he suggested that there was a moth somewhere in Madagascar that specializes on pollinating that particular orchid. A few years later, about five years later, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace published an article in which he suggested that the African hawk moth, Xanthopan morganae, 
actually has a proboscis that is nearly long enough to reach the nectaries. And uh, he predicted that such a population should exist in Madagascar. And it wasn't until uh, early 1900s when such a population was actually found in Madagascar. And it was named uh, Santopan Morgani subspecies predicta, based, of course, on Alfred Russell Wallace's prediction of that uh, the existence of that species. And uh, more recently, that subspecies was actually found to be identical with the uh, African population and it was actually subsumed and the subspecies no longer exist. A group um, of, uh, of plants that uh, contains uh, nearly 3,800 species worldwide, tropical and temperate areas, is Araceae or the Aroid family. Uh, think of Jack in the Pulp, it is a uh, more temperate Virginia example of this family that they form a very unusual inflorescence called a spadex that is partly or fully enclosed is a modified leaf called a bract. And the arrangement of the flowers and the mode of pollination of many members of that family is rather unusual. They simply form traps in order to attract and trap their pollinators in order for a more efficient pollination. So the spadex consists of two types of flowers, female larger flowers at the bottom, a ring of smaller male flowers above them, and then above the male flowers, there is a ring of uh, hairs or filaments. So um, the pollinators, a wide variety of flies, bees, beetles, get attracted to the heavy scents produced by the members of that family, enter inside the bract, and ultimately brush some of the pollen that they're carrying onto the female flowers. The female flowers, after they're fertilized, the male flowers open up, produce new pollen. But the pollinators at that time are prevented from leaving the inflorescence or the bract by the hairs above the male flowers. Once the flowers are pollinated, once the pollen is produced by the male flowers, those filaments simply wither, they dry, they die, open up the trap and allow the pollinators to exit and ultimately, of course, find their way to another flower of that same group or that same species. So a very efficient technique of uh, trapping and ultimately releasing your pollinators. And I mentioned that uh, ants are not effective pollinators. They're not good pollinators simply because only the males and the females possess wing <coughs> wings and the majority of the individuals, of course, the workers are fully wingless, but there is a species of orchid in Australia that is pollinated by one species of ant and only by the males of uh, the bulldog ant, Mermesia urens. And here you can see a male ant that is trying to copulate with the flower of that orchid. And that is because the orchid itself produces pheromones that mimic the pheromones of the female bulldog ant. So the male gets attracted to the flower, tries to copulate, and at the same time, gets loaded with pollinia or clusters of pollen that it carries to another flower. The flowers typically open before the emergence of the females, of course, increases the increase in the chances of pollination. And such form of pollination is known as pseudocopulation. And it occurs not only in this particular group of ants, but it occurs in a wide variety of wasps, uh, such as tiny, uh, tiny wasps and uh, uh, a vast array of both solitary and uh, eusocial bees. And uh, we mentioned probably the highest uh, level of specialization exhibited by fig wasps. Figs themselves produce uh, a very unusual inflorescent called ciconium, which represents a virtually an inverted flower of where flowers are on the inside and of course surrounded by the fleshy appendage of the inflorescence. And uh, these flowers produce, uh, these inflorescences contain three different types of flowers, two types of female flowers, short styled and long styled. In addition to that, they have male flowers. The wasps themselves are tiny, as you can uh, see on the image that is on the top left. So the female wasps enter that inflorescence through an opening called as the, uh, known as the osteoum. 
And then they use their ovipositors in order to lay eggs at the bottom of only the short styled flowers. Their ovipositors are only long enough to reach the ovaries of the short styled flowers. Therefore, the short styled female flowers produce wasps. The long styled female flowers produce seeds. And the male flowers are, of course, responsible for producing pollen. So the female lays eggs and ultimately dies shortly after. The eggs hatch, producing males and females. The males, on the other hand, are completely wingless, wingless, and they have two tasks and two tasks only. One of them is, of course, to find a receptive female and mate. And the second task is using their mandibles to actually chew an opening through the wall of the inflorescence that will allow the female to ultimately exit. And as she exits, she picks up some pollen, flies to another flower or another inflorescence, ultimately resulting in a cross-pollination. And again, these species are very, very specific in many cases, as specialized that they only can pollinate one particular species of the 850 plus species of figs that exist worldwide. But uh, and here in a nutshell is a very, very uh, general introduction to the group pollinate, the uh, groups of pollinators, the major groups of uh, pollination syndromes, and of course, a few examples, a variety of, if you wish, more unusual forms of uh, pollination. And that said, uh, why, should we, uh, why should we care, right? Uh, why should we even talk about pollination? But uh, if you think about it, terrestrial plants are virtually at the base of uh, every food web. A large variety of animals uh, are specialized to feed on different parts of uh, those plants, uh, whether in the larval stage, the immature stages, or as adults. Therefore, they're absolutely critical to terrestrial ecosystems. And similar roles, of course, are performed by different algal species in aquatic environments. And uh, of course, <clears throat> that means that um, if we are to uh, remove all those, uh, those plants, ultimately that will very easily lead to the collapse of most of those terrestrial ecosystems. After all, plants are by far the most abundant group of uh, organisms that are capable of converting solar radiation into biomass. And of course, from our more selfish perspective, more selfish reasons, if you wish, of course, those pollinators are important in, uh, excuse me, and of course, agriculture. A large fraction of uh, the food that we eat come as a result of the free services of pollinators. And those services have been estimated into hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide. A large fraction, not only of the food, but uh, the raw materials such as uh, timber uh, that we use. Uh, of course, uh, the precursors to many pharmaceuticals as a result of the free services of pollinators. Uh, in many cases, of course, even the, the dairy industry relies a large fraction on pollinators for uh, forage, for, uh, of course, uh, alfalfa production. So uh, if we are to uh, lose those free services, uh, we most likely will end up as a um, very different world in a world that will have probably far uh, fewer food choices. Uh, of course, probably more expensive food and uh, of course, uh, vastly different uh, agricultural practices. And uh, why am I saying that? Of course, I'm not by no means the, the first person that have noted that, but uh, our pollinators are under threat, probably uh, all of you have heard in the past about uh, colony collapse disorder or CCD, an unusual phenomenon that uh, has been actually noted throughout the history of apiculture. It's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, it has been known as uh, under many different names, 
such as uh, springed window or disappearing disease or uh, May disease. Uh, the term colony collapse disorder was coined in the U.S. in 2006 and refers to the fact that many colonies are losing most of their individuals. Most of the workers disappear, leaving uh, the queen and some of the brood behind and only a few uh, workers. Uh, similar disappearances have been noted, of course, in parts of Europe and more recently in Africa and Asia. There is most likely no single cause under underlying that phenomenon. Anything from use of uh, pesticides, insecticides that can directly harm honeybees or herbicides, of course, that can impact their uh, host plants to uh, changes in the environment. Current agricultural practices that eliminate diversity and uh, of course provide less foraging resources uh, leading to malnutrition uh, malnutrition, of course, uh, is uh, stressful. It can uh, lead to uh, ultimately a weakened immune system and, of course, uh, die off and shorter lives of many of the workers in a colony. Uh, their lack of genetic variation in many of the captive bred colonies of honeybees, the presence of uh, pathogens and of course the diseases for variety of different viruses that uh, they carry uh, the most destructive of all which is the, the varroa mites but it is very likely that uh, the colony collapse disorder is not caused by a single factor but rather by the synergistic effect by all of these factors and honeybees although not native to North America of course so by far one of the most uh, important pollinations of food crops. But uh, the same factors that are known to impact honeybees, of course, also impact our wild bee populations. Uh, very similarly, the loss of habitat, the loss of foraging plants, uh, the loss of nesting sites, of course, climate change, the changes of the current climatic condition causing different blooming periods and uh, many of those pollinators cannot keep up shifts in the distribution of their foraging plants. Uh, similarly, diseases and uh, parasites, insecticides and herbicides, the presence of invasive plant species that in many cases are grow so vigorously that they outcompete native plants and therefore reduce the quality and the amount of, of food that they use by native pollinators. Uh, and uh, related to that fact, of course, uh, pollinators uh, are not the only group that is declining. Uh, insects in general uh, have been uh, noted to experiencing uh, mild to severe declines in different parts of the world. And uh, probably some of you have, uh, of course, uh, heard the term that insect Armageddon. We still need uh, quite a bit more data in order to support such claims, but it is very likely that many species of invertebrates and not just insects are following similar trends. And uh, that of course means that uh, if we are to, to lose our pollinators, we will lose this not only to human agriculture, but also to natural communities. Ecosystems uh, function as a whole, and if one component of those ecosystems is removed, they will no longer be able to uh, function in the same manner. Uh, probably what will result is not as apocalyptic as the image that you see on uh, your screens, but we are likely facing a vastly, vastly different ecosystem services and ecosystems functions as a result of the loss of pollinators. And recognizing the importance of honeybees and other pollinators back in 2014, <laughs> excuse me, there was uh, a pollinator task force that was established. It is chaired by the United States Department of Agriculture and United States Environmental Protection Agency. And it was tasked with coming up with a strategy 
and a plan, research plan, and ultimately to mitigate the effects of the loss of, of pollinators. And the pollinator research plan was coined in 2015, and there are three overarching goals. One is to reduce the decline of honeybees and other pollinators to sustainable levels to promote the increase in numbers of um, monarch butterflies and protect their annual migration and ultimately to protect and restore millions of acres of land through uh, combined public and uh, private actions. Similar strategies have been developed in other countries and uh, most of them are still in the, the stage of filling gaps in our knowledge, mostly on research, what is actually happening before we can take actions in order to uh, preserve and protect pollinator communities. And one uh, example I wanna share with you is uh, that uh, regional, local, national, international laws can work. A great uh, successful story, of course, is the Endangered Species Act in the United States, which uh, helped bring the bald eagle, the symbol of this, of this nation, from the brink of extinction. Back in the 50s, there were only 412 breeding pairs of bald eagles. They were on the verge of collapse. The population was offered protection. They were deemed endangered. Ultimately, the population rebounded back and the bald eagle was delisted in 2007. A great example of how laws can work. The problem, of course, is in order for a species to get protection, they have to be designated as threatened or endangered. Currently, there are 1,661 species offered protection under the Endangered Species Act. Of those, 277 are invertebrates, and of those, only 87 are insects. And the rusty patched bumblebee, Bombus aphanus, was the first bee offered protection under the Endangered Species Act in the continental United States in 2017. In 2016, six species of yellow-faced bees endemic to the island of Hawaii were offered uh, similar protection. And the reason for that is that the rusty patch bumblebee has disappeared from most of its range, as you can see on this slide. There is still, uh, still currently a stronghold in the upper Midwest, especially in the southern part of Wisconsin, but only, only stray individuals have been recorded elsewhere, including Virginia, where that species back in the early 1900s was very, very common. Another great example is the American honeybee, Bombus pensylvanicus, which has suffered over 80% decline throughout its range in the Eastern United States. Probably a more uh, effective approach will be to offer legal protections, not to individual species, but ultimately to habitats. Protecting the environment actually offers protection to all the critters, all the animals and plants that inhabit it. Similar laws exist uh, throughout the world, but Virginia has a great example. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation back in the late 1980s established a system of nature preserves. Nature preserves that target some of the most unique communities such as the savage neck dunes that you see on uh, the top of the slide. These communities are offered protection, legally bound restrictions on any future activities on that land. They don't have to be owned by the state. They can be privately owned land. And protecting such communities is one of the greatest ways of protecting biodiversity, not just pollinators. Currently, there is over 60 such preserves providing protection to nearly 60,000 acres within the state of Virginia. And the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation not only offers protection, but in many of those habitats, they partake in restoration practices, such as exemplified here 
in the by Difficult Creek in Halifax County. Difficult Creek was once an open woodland savanna, very widely spaced oaks and hickories and short-leaf pines, but due to fire suppression, due to planting of loblolly pines, it quickly became overgrown and shaded. Many of those species have disappeared. And now DCR has taken on removing, cutting, selectively removing loblolly pines during annual burns in order to promote the reestablishment of the open savanna that one existed in that area. So what we're talking here are in many cases, laws, protections far above the head of any given individual. Uh, we can rarely, if ever, partake in uh, the planning stage and the decision making regarding protection to uh, individual species or individual habitats, but every single one of us very easily can actually help pollinators and pollinator communities. And what I'm talking about is, of course, following several very, very simple practices. And what we have here is, um, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Meaning that um, if you have a far, wide variety of native plants in your property in New York, let them be, do not replace them with uh, non-natives. Don't replace them with uh, attractive non-native species that may have large, very showy flowers, but may provide little in terms of uh, food resources, both for adults or immature stages. So of course, uh, try to avoid using pesticides whenever possible uh, that can harm directly the pollinators or their foraging uh, plants. Of course, um, uh, limit the amount of your mowed lawn. That is not good. Provide a little bit of open space because many of those bees, as I mentioned, are ground nesters. And of course, they need the appropriate habitats leave a brushy area at the end of your property, pretty much let it be. But if you wanna go further, if you wanna promote, if you wanna attract more pollinators, of course you can go even farther. And some of you I know have done it or have attempted it, uh, creating pollinator gardens, a wide variety of shrubs and plant, flowering plants, trees, open spaces, providing water resources, nesting resources, uh, avoiding using chemicals, avoiding non-native species, removing any invasives that may be present in your area. All of those will create perfect habitats and that will attract and allow, of course, local pollinators not only to reproduce, but ultimately increase in numbers, hopefully uh, go and uh, uh, migrate to, to nearby areas. And many of you may not have a green thumb, but uh, luckily for us, in, in our present day, there is a wide variety of resources available online, and one such great resource is the Pollination, <coughs> Pollinator Conservation Resource Center. You can easily find it online and provides a great variety of resources of where, where it be the vendors for seeds of native plants or hints of how to grow particular plants, what to grow, what to purchase for your region, identification guides, and so on and so forth. So all of you, us, can do our little to help native pollinators and ultimately try to halt, of course, that negative trend. And this is more or less in a nutshell what I have for you today. And before I conclude, I would like to advertise our upcoming reptile festival, of course, given the current uh, conditions and current circumstances, we will not be able to host visitors for our festival. It will be almost entirely an online presence. A variety of different videos and images and information will be shared on the VMNH's website. And uh, it will happen this Friday and Saturday. And in addition to the virtual reptile festival, and you see a link to uh, the Facebook page of VMNH at the bottom of my slide. But on Saturday between 12 and 3, we'll be hosting a drive-through experience, something that we have never done before. So you'll be able, for those at least that live uh, in the area, we'll be able to actually come and uh, share some experiences and we'll have a wide variety of uh, specimens from our collection. And uh, this is pretty much all I have for you right now, and uh, I'll be glad to take any questions if we have the time. Cal, can you stop sharing your screen so we can, um, there yes. we go. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Thank you, Cal, so much. I have learned a lot today, and I am sure everyone else who has stayed on has learned a lot. Um, we will be posting this recording on our website, as well as that link for the virtual reptile festival for the VMNH. Are there any questions for Cal? I don't see any coming in. Um, well, if, oh wait, I believe we got one coming in. Oh, well, we have been thanked for a great presentation. Cal, thank you so much. And You're everyone welcome. have a wonderful day. Go out and it's a gorgeous day here. So um, you can't tell, Cal, because you're down. No, no, I'm still inside, but I'll certainly take advantage. Definitely go get some sun today. And everyone, hopefully we'll see you next week for our next uh, webinar. And have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Cal. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.